Welcome back to another week of uh, Myths versus Facts. As we mentioned before, the Whiskey Rebellion was one of the main initiatives of the Jacobins. According to Washington, the Whiskey Rebellion was the first ripe fruit of the democratic societies. He believed that Albert Gallatin, a member of the Pennsylvania General Assembly at the time, was behind the rebellion. Gallatin, like Lafayette, seemed to know when to switch sides and become a moderate when his safety was involved. We point out the background of Gallatin in our book, but a quote concerning Gallatin I believe will tell the story. To a higher degree than any American, native or foreign born, unless Franklin, with whose broad nature he had many traits in common, Albert Gallatin deserves the proud title, aimed by many, reached by few, of citizen of the world. Gallatin represented Pennsylvania briefly in the Senate and the House of Representatives before being named Secretary of the Treasury by Jefferson. It's interesting that Jefferson appointed him as Treasury Secretary since Jefferson was against the National Bank, but Gallatin supported it. Gallatin then went on to become the Minister to France under James Madison. By the way, while we are not going to get into, this, into it in this series, those who supported or opposed a national bank depended on whether they were in the government or out of power. Those out of power opposed the banks. Once they were in power, they supported it, and back and forth. Today, if you search the web or dive into many books, you will more than likely find that Andrew Jackson is promoted as the one that destroyed the national bank. What he really did was split up the money and federal financing among his friends friendly to Jackson, then had the process continue behind the scenes. Last week, we briefly discussed that one of the least reported aspects of the Whiskey Rebellion was the suppression of the clergy. The main propaganda argument used against the American clergy was that they were using the pulpit to, to preach politics the same argument used by liberals and socialists today against the Christian right. Apparently it's all right if the pulpit is used to support socialist initiatives, but not constitutional ones. It is part of the political correctness of the day, and this political correctness battle is as old as the country itself. During the late 1700s, the western portion of the United States tended to be wrapped up in subversive activities and this was to be the case for a few decades. This was due to two basic factors. One, the West was isolated from the coastal settlements. Many felt separated from the country. And two, the French were very active in trying to separate the West, sending in their agents, as well as the English and Spanish agents. Jefferson also didn't help the situation. He made things more difficult because he defended the revolutionaries wrote letters of apology for Weishaupt and the Illuminati, and at the same time chastised those who wrote against the Illuminati, such as Robinson and Barrowell. Jefferson even wrote that such people's attacks on the Illuminati by Reverend Jedediah Morris, by the way, the leading American who exposed the Illuminati, were the rantings of a bedlamite, meaning a madman. The coordinating factor to all of this agitation came from the leadership of the French ambassador, Edmond Charles Genet. He was sent to America in 1793. His purpose was to bring America into the French orbit or split the United States apart in the process. Instead of presenting himself to Washington for accreditation upon his arrival, Genet led the efforts to use United States territory to assail the English and participated in riling mobs up against Washington and the federal government. Genet had no problem with violating American law. He held French courts, enlisted Americans into armies to invade Florida and the Mississippi Valley under the command of George Rogers Clark. He was so brazen that he demanded Hamilton to arm the armies from federal funds. Hamilton and other officers, of course, refused and the armies dissolved, never to be really formed. Washington was not pleased, yet Jefferson, as Secretary of State in the Washington cabinet, 
continued to defend Genet. As all of this activity was taking place, America was playing right into the hands of the English who wanted to seize American ships and shipping. The British would actually take American sailors off our ships and press them into indentured service on British vessels. The actions of Genet partially gave the excuse to the British for their actions. We came close to being involved in a war between England and France due to the Jacobins, when Washington was trying to maintain neutrality. When Genet uh, landed at Charleston, South Carolina, he was enthusiastically greeted by the governor, William Moultrie, a Federalist. He landed there in order to create public enthusiasm for the representative of the French Revolution. Genet took his time getting to the capital with every town on the way holding celebrations in his honor. In New York, Governor George Clinton, a member of the Columbian Illuminati, marched with Genet through the streets of Manhattan while the crowds yelled to enthrone Genet as the head of the country. In every instance, the red cap of liberty used by the Jacobins of France appeared and were circulated. You know, this reminds us of the caps worn by the women's marches against Trump and denotes considerable organization having been done both at the women's marches and Genet's celebrations. The women's caps carried a name called after the feminine anatomy. And what many do not know is that the red liberty caps were symbolic of the male anatomy. So we see the same sort of things occurring over and over again. Genet overall played a very important role in the forming and aiding the Jacobin movement. Genet founded the Philadelphia Society, the mother lodge of the democratic societies in Philadelphia, which was the center of French emigres and became our capital for a time. The former aides to the Illuminist Lafayette settled in Philadelphia. We document many of the problems that Genet fomented in his attempt at overthrow the Washington government and make the United States a part of the French Revolution in our book. It is a story of our early history that is generally unknown. Washington finally tired of the machinations of Genet and had the French government recall him. There had been a change in the government in France and he probably would have been beheaded had he returned as a leader in a rival faction. So Hamilton urged Washington to allow him to stay, even though Genet and the Jacobins targeted Hamilton more than any other man in America, trying to eliminate him from influence. Genet did stay in America, married the daughter of Governor Clinton, and remained behind the scenes in illuminist activities. More on this next week.